It is episode 20 of Bubblelog and I am going to be talking about two sweaters. One is a project that I have already started working on and the other is one that I am going to be casting on soon. Greetings and welcome to my little woolly corner of the world. My name is Bobby Olan and I am a knitter and a fiber explorer in Victoria, Australia. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live and create, the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. I live here with my partner and this is my craft room for anyone who has watched my episodes from the very beginning when I was still calling the vlog uh, Platypus Knitting, which is the name of my channel. You can see that is the chair there where um, I used to record from. And this wall here um, has been my most recent backdrop. So I used to have the camera over there and I would be turned around facing that way um, and you would see that. But excitingly, um, I have a brand new computer, which is what I am recording on today. So I am seeing how that goes using this completely new setup. So uh, you can see a lot more of my messy room. Um, but hopefully it it all works and it all goes really well. I'm really excited um, to have this this new computer and some um, trying out some new editing software. So I guess let's jump into talking about all the exciting stuff. Um, first up, I just have a really quick um, eye candy, which is actually nothing to do with knitting, but it is crafting related. So I thought I wanted to include it anyway. My cousin, who I made the Big Mood mittens for recently, she loved them by the way, she has recently taken up resin um, and she made me a little trinket dish. She actually intended this as a coaster, but I, when I got it, I thought it was so beautiful that I wanted to use it as a trinket dish instead. She knows me, she knows the colors I like, so she made this absolutely gorgeous blue and green cloudy swirl loveliness uh, and I just I just think it's 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 so gorgeous. I may um, eventually use it as a proper trinket dish and put my jewelry in it. I did have these earrings sitting in it initially, but right now I've just got this beautiful cloud of um, silk. Can see how fine it is there maybe can you um, which I got from uh, which I got as part of doing the spinning class at the hand weavers and spinners guild which is now finished but anyway the other thing that I really love about this trinket dish is I have this set of coasters here, this old set of coasters that we actually got from my partner's grandmother. And it didn't even occur to me when I asked my cousin to make me the hexagon shaped trinket dish that it would be a perfect match and fit in perfectly with these coasters here. So I just love it even more now. Um, anyway, that that's that. I just thought that was a really sweet Oh no, my silk cloud. So delicate. <laughs> um, anyway, that is just a really sweet little gift that I got and it makes me so happy that she has taken up a form of crafting. <laughs> Uh, moving on, uh, a short eyes and ears. I just wanted to recommend the channel 111 Windmills. So that is by Lisa. She doesn't have an actual uh, vlog podcast series type thing um, and she doesn't have a lot of videos out there but I do really enjoy what she does have out there. In particular, she did a four-part series, I believe it was, 
for a spin along that she was running but she the way that she did the videos was in the form of a tutorial um, taking you through how to use a drop spindle which I would have found so helpful back when I was learning how to use the Turkish spindle that I um, had made for me towards the start of the year. I've moved past those very very basic basics now but it is still it's always great to go back and refresh yourself on what things are called, how other people do certain techniques, just in case, you know, there's, there's always something, um, there's always an opportunity to learn something new because people do things in so many different ways, you never know. So um, I thought that in particular was really great on Lisa's channel. She also does make and sell some really lovely and unique um, accessories, um, trinkets, tools I think for, for knitters and crafters so if you just look up 111 windmills or even better check the links in the YouTube description below um, then you can see the beautiful things that she makes and I'm super super happy that I was actually able to get the advent that she is putting out at the end of the year so I this is the first advent that I've actually signed up for and I've always been a bit hesitant to sign up for yarn advents because I I guess I like to know what I'm getting I want to make sure that I like it. I mean I lo I it, it it'd be pretty hard um, to get something that I wouldn't like I think but I don't know I with, with yarn I just haven't quite crossed that bridge yet but her advent is tools trinkets accessories I'm just gonna call them trinkets from now on um, knitting and crafting trinkets um, and that really interested me and then on top of that her theme was um, creatures of myth and folklore which I just absolutely love. I love myth and folklore and, and folk stories and fables and all of those kind of things so I'm really excited to, to, to get that at the end of the year. I had seen her putting posts out about it on Instagram and in the lead up to her putting out the pre-order and for some reason I didn't put it in my calendar even though I knew I wanted it and all this time went by and I started thinking gee I thought she was putting that out soon uh, why haven't I have I missed it have I <laughs> oh, I haven't heard anything for a while and I went back and looked at her Instagram feed and um, it the, the pre-order went live uh, at the very very start of this month and sold out within an hour so I was pretty crushed at that um, but then uh, I guess it was so popular that she's decided to do a second and final release and that one I put in my calendar and um, as soon as my alarm went off for it I bought it and I'm just really super happy and excited to be getting that one. So um, I recommend checking out the 111 Windmills channel on YouTube but also just checking out uh, their online store, Lisa's online store. Next up is Handy Dandy. So this is what we have come here for I guess. So the first sweater that I am going to be talking about is the Redford sweater. So. I have shown this in the last couple of episodes and last episode what I had done was back piece and a front piece. So these have now been blocked. All of the pieces I've made have now been blocked and I have actually also made two sleeves and two side pieces. So while I am really happy with the progress that I have made, I have made the two sleeves and the side pieces um, completely in the last two weeks since the last episode went out. Um, 
Sadly, I have not made the deadline for this project. My partner's birthday is actually today and obviously this isn't in a wearable state. So the next things that I have to do is obviously seam it all together, but then once it is all seamed together, um, there's the cuffs, the neckband and the hem. So there is still a bit of work to do, but um, I will definitely have it done by next episode, but hopefully actually sooner than that, hopefully, you know, in the next couple of days. So that is that. One thing that I think I had mentioned in the previous episode is how much I absolutely loved the slope bind off, um, which hasn't changed. I still love it and I think it's beautiful, but I had said, although it looks really nice, it's a shame that um, it isn't visible. Once it's seamed, it's sort of tucked under and hidden. But I had forgotten that this pattern, um, this pattern is Redford by Julie Hoover, if I haven't mentioned that. This pattern actually has expressed or visible seams. So that sloped bind off is actually going to show through as a detail on the front, which is, it's just such a great sweater. It's just the, it just has a lot of little details that just make it really good. Um, I, yeah, it's, I think it's just gonna look, look amazing once it's, it's put together. And again, I just love this, um, triangular detail at the front. The way that that was done was interesting and it just looks really effective. Um, one thing that I will say about it, I'll pull out one of the side pieces cause I think it's easier to see cause it's narrow is, um, the twisted slip chain the twisted chain selvage which is a form of um, slip stitch edges that is done um, in the pattern I I did that but one side of it looks really neat there's the back of it there you can see it's 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 I mean it's curling in obviously but they're really neat little stitches but the other side of it is just loose and sloppy and I could not figure out how to fix that. Um, maybe I was doing them wrong, I don't know, but it was, it was something that I was aware of while I was knitting it, but it became even more obvious once these were blocked and I was pinning them out onto the blocking boards. So pretty much for all of them I had minimal pins on on this side here which is the good side and I had a lot more pins on the side that is a lot looser because it was a lot looser and it wasn't giving me a nice clean edge on the blocking board so that was kind of interesting um yeah if I do make this again which if it fits my partner well and he's really happy with it I think I will because I really enjoyed making it and it is it, it is technically interesting, um, but I might double check the pattern to see that I'm doing this correctly. Um, I have a feeling I might have seen Arata after the fact um, that was referring to this salvage edge. Um, so I, I'll check that, but yeah, that'll be for next time if and when there is a next time. Um, so that is that. The other thing that slip stitch salvage affected is these little pointy bits on the, um, on the side panel. They got really, really fiddly to do because at the top of it, it's just two stitches. You, you're working back and forth on two, sti two stitches and one of them is being a twisted slip stitch and just the way that it worked it was it was very very fiddly to do and I would not be surprised if I accidentally um, missed um, a row or two somewhere among all of these pointy bits but who knows <laughs> um, I mean it looks right they're the same length and everything so hopefully when I seam it all together it will come out fine. Um, the seaming of this bit I am quite concerned about doing so wish me luck we'll see how that goes. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about with this one 
is um, I thought I'd just explain a bit more about how I had to recalculate rows in particular when I realized that my gauge was actually wrong and um, I started knitting it to the stitches of a different size but I was still using the lengths of the actual size that I was aiming for so I just wanted to talk through that a bit now. So I like to use this little um, software app called Numi. It, I'm only using the free version, but it is only available on Macs and not PCs. So um, sorry to all the PC users out there, but I find this a really helpful um, little program just for doing all of the calculations. You can also, of course, just use a spreadsheet or a calculator. Um, and I do also have to apologize. The way that this all works is um, I'm looking at the program, which is there for me, but I know um, that it is appearing on that side of the screen for you guys. So sorry if that is a little uh, disconcerting, um, but this is how I sort of figured out the, um, the, the, the rows and the decrease rates and all of that kind of thing um, when I realized that my gauge was quite different to the pattern. So I can just say here, my gauge was 32 rows and the pattern gauge was 36 rows I believe so let's see if I've got this right if I do my gauge divided by the pattern gauge it gives me 0.89 let's call that um, the sub substitution so for example, say the pattern is telling me to um, knit for 20 inches. So pat length equals 20 inches. So in the pattern's row gauge, that would be, let's see if I'm remembering how to do all of this math right pat length divided by four because the um, the gauge is over four and then that times the pattern gauge um, it's saying to knit for 180 rows for my gauge divided by four times my gauge oh what have I done there it's saying to knit for 160 rows. And then I just like to double check that by doing um, the 180, you don't need to name everything. Um, so the 180, which I am getting from this, um, the, the rows for the pattern gauge. So 180 times the sub, rate of 0.89 and yes it is still saying that 160 rows is what I want to be knitting um, to get the right length for the pattern. So that is uh, one thing that I do. The other thing is say for example within that 20 inch length there are six decreases. Pattern rows divided by the decreases is 30 180 rows to get the to the 20 inches and there needs to be a decrease every 30 rows so the 30th row is the decrease so i'm going to rename this bit mr for my rows for me i need to say my rows divided by the decreases 26.67 depending which row you're meant to be doing the decrease on the wrong side or the right side row um, you would just adjust that up or down so it can be on row 26 or on row 25 or on row 27 um, whatever that needs to be so the other way that i do it so this number 30 here so it's saying that for the pattern it's 30 rows to get to one decrease right so if i say just to double check 30 times that sub 
it's it's giving me the same number i feel like when i actually did it with the um numbers that the pattern was giving me there were instances was i where i was getting for example um one equation would be 26.67 and then the checking it with the sub rate it would be like 25.73 or something like that and that was just a way to help me know if I was better off rounding down or rounding up um, if I could compare those two numbers together I haven't got um, the the pattern in front of me and it, it's a paid pattern so I don't really yeah I don't really want to be giving away the actual numbers or anything like that but this is sort this <laughs> it's there for me it's here for you this is the um an example of how i would be working all of those that stuff out so that my um decrease rate matches what the finished garment should have instead of just if i were still doing the decreases every 30 rows instead of every 26 rows then i would have a much more um gradual slope and the garment could end up being too long so um i just thought i'd i'd share that um just quickly on this software because i love it so much one other really neat thing about it is that um it can do all sorts of the conversions for you so this pattern was in inches which is why i gave the example in inches but in australia we're on the metric system and i usually um, do convert things to centimeters if I write 20 inches two centimeters it it can do that conversion for me which I think is really neat um, anyway it's been a while but I do also have a stat chat for you just a few numbers on the Redford sweater the back came in at 85 grams the front piece came in at 82 grams. The sleeves, one sleeve, sleeve A, was 60, 60 grams. The second sleeve was a little bit lighter for some reason. That one was 58 grams. And then the sides uh, were closer than that um, so for both of the sides together it was 41 grams so one side was 20 grams one side was 21 who knows why these things change um, and you can see here uh, the total so far is 326 grams so the the pattern was recommending that I get 400 grams of yarn um, and considering it's just all of those bands left um, that was a pretty good estimate and I really didn't need to buy the extra fifth skein that I did but I'm sure I will have no trouble putting that to good use. The next project that I am planning to cast on is going to be a sweater for myself and um, I am going to be uh, making it as part of the Colors of Fall Knit Along, the Cough Cal for this year, uh, which is run by the Yarniacs. So the Yarniacs podcast is uh, one of the first podcasts that I ever listened to. And I have always wanted to uh, join in this Knit Along, um, but it's just never quite worked out. But finally, I'm committing to it and I'm going to do it. And I'm really, really excited about doing it so um what this knit along is the colors of fall they call it because they're in in the u.s so they are basing it on um the pantone color trend forecast for fall um for the upcoming season pantone has color trend forecasts they have a few different palettes so they have um, a london palette and a new york palette each of those palettes has a series of, I guess, brighter colors um, that are their color trend forecasts for the season. And then they also have a neutral palette as well. So this, um, this knit along allows you to choose any of those colors or any combination of those colors. And as long as um, 
as long as the yarn that you are using passes the squint test for matching one of those colors even if it's only um, matching the speckles in a yarn that's enough um, to uh, be eligible for this knit along so it's really quite flexible and I really like it basically. They are also aware that half of uh, the world is in a completely different um, time zone, seasonal zone um, than what they are in. So you can also choose from the um, London or New York spring summer um, palettes instead of the winter fall palettes. So I am working in this color. This is, gosh, I just threw out the label. It was just on my desk. So I can't remember <laughs> what the colorway is. Um, that's really bad. I'll put it in the video. Anyway, this is a uh, Bendigo Woolen Mills Tweed, which is sadly uh, discontinued now, um, discontinued for now, whatever that means. But I really like this yarn. I have said many times before that tweed yarns are my favorite. And um, as soon as they came out with um, a tweed yarn, I bought this. Um, and it's been sitting there for a few years. Um, and I'm so happy that I finally found a project to use it in. So actually three, no, all of the palettes, London, spring, summer, London, winter, fall, New York, spring, summer, New York, winter, fall, they all have a variety of yellow in them. Um, one of them is a really pale yellow. The other three yellows are quite similar to each other. So this one, I actually couldn't decide uh, between a couple of different ones um, and it would pass the the squint test for three of the colors really but considering I'm in the southern hemisphere I thought I should choose the yellow that is in one of the um, spring summer palettes so I am matching this to the color daffodil that Pantone has um, in that trend forecast um, I think the 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 other one that I would have picked for a winter fall color is called spicy mustard. Anyway, not important. Uh, the thing that I am making is this sweater here. If you don't recognize it, this is the knitted cable source book by Nora Gorn. I love cables, and I think Nora Gorn is a genius. And um, I've I've had my eye on making this sweater for a while. It's just a really interesting construction. Um, this sort of flared bit bit at the back is is done um, in a way that I I've never constructed a sweater before. So I'm really excited about doing that. Um, the brilliant genius thing about this book is she. She sets out a system that makes it really easy for you to substitute cables and within the patterns that she has in here, um, she says if you don't want to use the cable that is in the pattern, look for a cable that um, is this many, um, or she calls it uh, the stockinette stitch equivalent, um, the SSE system. So she says the cable that's in the pattern is a um, has a an SSE of 25 stitches, for example. So find another cable pattern in the book that is 25 stitches SSE or less. And if it's less, you just put in more of the filler stitches on the sides of it so I think that is just absolutely brilliant and of course I uh, couldn't resist um, doing coming up with my own cable substitution so just to show you again that's what the front looks like and I am swatching this here this narrower panel here is replacing this side panel and there'll be one on the other side as well and then this larger one here is um, replacing the central panel there. I'm swatching this in 
on 4.5 millimeter needles. The pattern calls for five millimeter needles on DK weight yarn. This this is DK weight yarn, but I was I sort of thought I'd try to aim for a maybe like a tighter gauge just to make the sweater a bit more um, hard wearing, particularly as this has a bit of a loose ply. So I just wanted to give it that extra um, strength um, by, by going a little bit tighter. So I went down a needle size, but I actually suspect that I'm going to end up getting gauge. Um, but I am happy with, with how sturdy and also soft of course the fabric feels so um, if I get gauge then I mean that's even easier because I don't have to do all of those messy calculations that I just showed you and I can just use the numbers um, from the pattern itself for once so we'll see how I go with that but um, these are both patterns these cables are both patterns um, from the book so this main one here is a 28 row repeat and then this one here um, it's actually i believe a 24 row repeat so i elongated this straight bit um, to match the 28 rows just so i didn't have to do any extra messy keeping track of what row i am on two different charts um, and i actually charted them out um, side by side onto graph paper just to make it easier for myself to follow um, yeah so this swatch that I have done so far it is two full repeats so um, I am going to do one just one more repeat for a couple of different reasons the first one is I am um, while I do like that this one here um, just feels a lot more sort of solid and straight in comparison to the sort of meandering cables of this one. I am a bit concerned that maybe it's a bit too strong um, and that straight bit is just too long and therefore making it too prominent. The other reason that I am doing um, the extra repeat in this swatch is because I realized that there are only two right side rows in this cable pattern where you don't do any cables. Um, every other right side row you're doing a bunch of cable crossings in. So I thought it might be interesting if this big cable here that's on this one was actually on the rows where there are no cable crossings in the big one. Um, I mean, you can't really tell by looking at this where those rows are, but I kind of just wanted to see how it worked. A, to, um, to bring these two closer together, because right now one repeat only has one of these big cable crossings. So that's A and B to, um, yeah, just, just to see how they play together in that new and different way. So um, once I have done that one extra repeat, then I'll few, do, do a few decreases and just do a chunk of stockinette stitch as well. And then um, I'll block it and see how I go and if I have to do any more calculations there. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention about the cable substitutions is how I chose um, the cables that I was going to substitute. I started off by looking for the main one that I liked that was sort of similar to what's in the original and that had a similar um, stockinette stitch equivalent. And then the next challenge was to find um, the side panels that would also have that comparable stockinette stitch equivalent. But the thing that helped me refine um, the choice of these is that the, these cables are all two stitch over two stitch crossings. So when I was looking at side panel cables, I was also looking for ones that were two stitches crossing over two stitches. Now this big cable in the middle is actually six stitches crossing over six stitches, but because those six stitches are knit to purl to knit to, it still looks like 
there's the it's it still looks like it's two tubes of two stitches crossing over so I still think it um, it it feels like it still matches this one here <sighs> so um, how long have I been recording? I don't know, but I did just want to mention one more thing about this and that is that, um, so the back of the sweater is you knit a long rectangular bit which is going to form the flare that you can kind of see from the front. In the pattern that is just a big rectangle of stockinette stitch. I actually want to do a couple of things with it. One is I want it to have pockets. I've never knit pockets before. So that is one thing. And the other thing is I want to put cables in there uh, because on Ravelry, I saw some other people who had done stitch patterns in there um, and I thought they looked really good. I'm pretty sure they were just things like um, moss stitch, but it was a while ago that I looked and I might might not have looked super closely and they could have done something more complicated than that. Um, but they sort of look like moss stitch or a seed stitch and I thought, thought they looked really good. And because you can kind of see it a little bit from the front, I thought it would be nice to do something interesting. So I found this page in the book, which has these two um, cable patterns on it. This is, whoop, this is the one that I really fell in love with and I really wanted to use. Um, and probably right up until yesterday, I was certain that I was going to go with that one. But then when I originally picked it, I thought, okay, I would rather have this and not have pockets um, because I couldn't see how to fit pockets in that. But then I decided that I do actually want pockets and I was trying to figure out if, um, should I just extend the ribbing a lot longer and fit the pocket into the ribbing section? But then how is that going to look with a pocket in it? And then I also realized that um, these cables here are three stitches crossing over three stitches. So that messes with my whole plan of trying to make things match by having two stitches crossing over two stitches. So I, I'm going to have to find some other project to use this in because I absolutely love this one. I love how, you know, the ribbing is just, um, goes into these slanty cables here. I love this cable here. I love, um, the sort of woven look of those cables there. I just, I love everything about this one and I have to use it for something. It's just not going to be right for this project, sadly, but this one right beside it, it actually turns out it's kind of perfect because it's all two stitches over two stitches and it has the stockinette stitch here which I'll I'll be able to put a pocket into much more easily. So I will still have to make this a little bit longer um, to comfortably fit a pocket um, but that's that's fine. You can see as well that this one is really long so if I had to make this longer I'm not sure it might have actually made that back panel too long which wouldn't have worked um, but because this one is shorter I have I feel like there's more flexibility to play with the length so if I add some length I can add a pocket um, and the thing that I'll decide right at the very end is whether I want the um, opening of the pocket to be stockinette stitch or ribbing or if I want to use this cable across the top of the pocket. I'll decide that when I get to it. Um, yeah, so I am really excited to cast that on. Uh, the cast on is actually going to be taking place uh, before this episode goes out. So this is another thing that I love about this colors of full knit along is that the cast on date is the um, solstice. It's the winter solstice for us down here in the southern hemisphere um, and then it ends on the on what for us is the spring equinox so I love that it's just using those markers and I love that it's you know using the trend the color trend forecasts and isn't that just so pretty isn't it just coming out so nice the color just makes me so happy <laughs> oh yes that's the colors of fall knit along. Mm -hmm.
that's all that I've got time for today. Thank you so much for joining me、um, for this episode. I hope that you're all doing well, finding time to spend with your loved ones,、um, taking time to look after yourselves, and finding time for knitting, crocheting, crafting,、uh, whatever it is、uh, that makes you happy、um, and brings you joy and relaxation.、Um, If you enjoyed this video, then please give it that old thumbs up. And I hope you also consider subscribing to my channel, Platypus Knitting. You can also find me on Instagram at Platypus Knitting or、uh, on Ravelry under my name, Bobby Olin. There is a、uh, link. In the description below to a website where I have the transcripts,、um, and in that YouTube description below、uh, are also all of the links to all of the patterns and yarns and everything else that I have mentioned in this video.、Um, I, I hope to hear from you on one of these platforms, and I hope you are all doing well. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Fare thee well. Bye.